Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let's open with a word of prayer. Dear loving God, we thank you for the opportunity to be gathered together in the flesh as well as online. And we thank you that we can have this privilege of being able to study and discuss your word, discuss your work in the earth at this time. We pray that your Holy Spirit would come amongst us, would speak to our hearts, would dwell with us. Give us that peace that passes understanding. Help us, Lord. Many of us have had a hard week. We're tired and we ask for a refreshment. We ask for your Holy Spirit to refresh and revive our souls. Please help us to see um, this truth in all its beauty and all its glory and help us to settle into it that we might be ready to meet you in the flesh and to meet you face to face. We long for that day. We pray now that your Holy Spirit would guide and teach and instruct us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome everybody. It's been a, I think it was... It's been a nice time already, but it's, uh, I think people are tired, so we're going to have to stay awake and interact. <laughs> I'm going to start by reading a quote from CET. So, CET, we're going to talk about the midnight cry, about the message and how we got here and where we are now. I really want to focus on where we are now, so I don't want to spend too long doing how we got here, but it's 229.1, and I just read this this morning and felt a bit of encouragement over it, so I thought we'd just talk about this a little bit. So if you've got the mic, you can look that up. CET 229.1, you could put it in the chat. So it says, now, I'm going to please post it here. That's it. <clears throat> now the church is militant. Now we are confronted with a world in midnight darkness, almost wholly given over to idolatry. But the day is coming in which the battle will have been fought, the victory won. The will of God is to be done on earth as it is done in heaven. Mm -hmm. Then the nations will own no other law than the law of heaven. All will be a happy united family, clothed with the garments of praise and thanksgiving. The robe of Christ's righteousness, all nature in its surpassing loveliness, <coughs> will offer to God a constant tribute of praise and adoration. The world will be bathed in the light of heaven. The years will move on in gladness. The light of the moon will be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold greater than it is now. Over the scene, the morning stars will sing together, and the sons of God will shout for joy, while God and Christ will unite in proclaiming there shall be no more sin, neither shall there be any more death. Mm -hmm. I thought that was a bit of encouragement as to where mm -hmm. we're headed and getting our focus on that we are nearing the end of this journey and I wanted to pick out a couple of words from that quote. And we read this in a certain way. It's very clothed in, it's clothed in religious language. The, the world is given over to idolatry, which in our minds is like ancient Israel worshiping Baal. People have got false idols and it's kind of religious language. But I want us to kind of broaden our perspective and see that as we've been doing in the movement, this is more than about a religious right controversy. And it's about, um, let's see what it's about. So it says, we are confronted with a world in midnight darkness. And if we do parable teaching, if the world is in midnight darkness, this is why we have a midnight cry. So we have light, we have light and it's a midnight cry. Mm -hmm. And as the world gets darker and darker, midnight's the darkest time. We actually, I think it's just before dawn, but midnight is a dark time and we are in the light. We have got the message that the world needs to get them out of this midnight darkness, mm -hmm. if they were willing to accept it. Mm -hmm. She says, the church is militant. And we know when we do compare and contrast, we want to be triumphant. Mm -hmm. Militant's the opposite of it. Triumphant to me is like being in heaven with Christ. And we're not quite there yet, but it ha he has to do something to his people on earth to prepare them to make that shift from earth to heaven. And to me, that's the Millerite history where they were, if we look at the first part of the Millerite history, when they were transitioning to move from the holy place to the most holy place, he gave them a midnight cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And they were preparing to move what they thought then was off the earth and that's what we're doing and um, so we're in that time period right near the end of the line on the millerite line if we just look at our original millerite line i know it's 1850 and beyond we've done we've done more than that but in terms of using the parable with the midnight cry language we are right down near the end and this church militant when you look up the word militant it means vigorously active combative aggressive radical fanatic 
and especially in support of a cause or ideal and I put in there or ideology. So when you've got a cause or an ideology that you're fighting for, you aggressively push it. And this is what why radical feminists, we could say militant feminists, we could put in there. So we are to be a church militant. And when you look at that in the times we're living now, you think actually that's a bit different than just being like in the Lord's army, you know, that picture we had before. We are militantly active on this ideology. And these are words that we're using now. And I think it's important to talk about what is ideology to people? What is an ideology? Don't Google it yet. Go on. Straight off the head. Nelda, were you going to say? What's, what's an ideology? It's a thing. It's a belief system. It's what they think. Anything else? Uh, you break up the word ology, the study of. Okay, like theology, study of God. Okay. The deep study of an idea, the ideology, the study of this idea. Right, good, break it down, good idea, ideology. It's a system of ideas and ideals, especially one which forms the basis. So when we use it in society, when they say, what's your ideology, it's often political. So they say, especially which forms the basis of economic or political theory and policy. Principles in which practical elements are as prominent as theoretical ones. So it's principles that you're taught that you put into practice. So with governments, they wanna make a difference. They wanna make laws that make a difference to people that actually put them into practice. And that's their ideology. So, and, and it's very interesting. So we, we would say theology because theo comes from the Greek word for God. So we've got God study. So when you study something, it's important to you. You spend time on it. You're educated in it. You're not, it's not just something, a fleeting moment. It's a, it's a whole way of living. And I think that's important. We, we're in this warfare of ideologies. That's what we're in. And I think we didn't see it in that quite in that light before. And we've also been using the word ethos. What's ethos? Does anyone know what ethos means? It means character. It's the, from the Greek word eth, something, which means character. So it's the characteristic spirit of a culture, era, or community as manifested in its aptitudes and aspirations. So we've got ideology, which is um, a set of ideas, I'm going to say. Uh, I'm, I'm going to put into brackets to live by because it's very practical as well. And then you've got ethos, which is the character. Um, I'm going to summarize that. The character, characteristic spirit of a culture or community. So let's put the characteristic spirit. So is there a difference then between them? What is the difference? Like the idea, the ideology that you have of an ethos. So how you envisage your ethos should be. So you study these ideas of what your character should be in your community. Okay. So presumably when people have ideology, like political ideology, they want to make the community better. They want to do something to improve the way that community relates to each other, could we say, the way they interact with each other. Cause and effect. Right. So if you have a certain ideology, it produces a certain ethos or character. And we would say this, if we hold certain doctrines, it will produce character. We've talked about for years that your character is affected by your belief system. And so whatever ideology someone might have, um, they still make they may actually um manifest. So somebody might have right-wing ideology loosely, but they may manifest different characteristics. So you may have more maybe that's still very extreme. They've still got extreme ideology which manifests those characteristics. But I think you can get two people who perhaps profess to believe the same thing but might act differently. Um, we know that in the church there's wheat and tares and they might not have the character but they have the ideology. So it's very similar but we're using these words and it, we know that it produces, if you have the wrong set of ideas it's going to produce the wrong character. And this is the root of the great controversy. God has got a problem of information. People believe the wrong thing about him and now he has to correct that thinking to get us to be on the right side of the question. So we've known for a long time now that we're in an information war. And it started in heaven with Lucifer. Lucifer challenges the character of God and God has to now come back with an argument. And it's a war of words and it goes back and forth and people have to choose now, is this God worthy of service? Is he who he says he is? Or do I choose the enemy, the wrong stream? And of course it's very close. Lucifer's a light bearer. In heaven, it was pretty close, I'm sure. And we think it was pretty easy to see because we know who God is, but at the time they looked similar and they hadn't exerted their authority, the Godhead, 
And so now it looks it's a bit confusing. Go on. I think that plays into the definition that you gave of ideology, and that in given it was an ideology that's at stake how the government of heaven should operate. And if you had, if I remember correctly, what you had read about ideology is a set of ideas relating to government. Yes. Um, government. And that's what happened in heaven. Lucifer had this idea of how the government should run, and God had this idea of how the government should run. And both of those funnels funneled into a resulting character on both sides. And God is saying, if you follow my government, you'll result in this type of character, this type of ethos. Mm -hmm. And Lucifer is saying, okay, but you can have a different character on the without getting into freedom equality, but mm -hmm. one that's more leaning towards freedom if you follow this government. Right. Definitely. And, and I think this quote as well brings it out slightly lower down. So it says, almost wholly given I over to idolatry. So let's see, what is idolatry? What's idolatry? So on and its root, worshipping an idol? Apis bull? So it could be worshipping an apis bull god, a false god, which is what you said, an idol, basically. Because when we think of Old Testament terms, they're literally bowing down to an image. Um, but the definition, one of the, the Google definition, extreme admiration, love or reverence for something or someone other than the God of heaven, I've put in there, because one of the definitions was other than the Abrahamic God in a Christian setting. Mm -hmm. So anything that um, you have extreme admiration, love or reverence for. And when people hold ideas strongly, can we not say they love those ideas? So you can, can you have idolatry if you worship an ideology? If you have a set of ideas, you think that is the truth. That is the way I want to be. You know, I'm anti-feminist. That's your ideology. That's your. Um, the definition was just Google: extreme admiration, love, or reverence for something or someone. No, there's another one. It, there, were, there were two. That was the first definition: was admiration, love, or reverence for something or someone. But then it said in a Christian context, um, Abrahamic God, anything other than the Abrahamic God. Um, but I was thinking ideology, science, men's ideas, people can idolize those above God because they're putting it before God. They love it more than God. It's, it's idolatry, really, when you idolize your own thinking, your own ideas. So this says the whole world is almost given over to idolatry. So we look around and they're not all worshiping a football team. They're not all worshiping their cars and houses. It's not physical necessarily because we sometimes say it like that as Adventists. We say, you know, they, they're attached to their cars or they worship their job or, you know, something physical in a way. But it's ideology. They can worship an ideology or hold an ideology. And it says the day is coming in which the battle will have been fought. The will of God will be is to be done on earth. Then the nations will own no other law than the law of heaven. So this controversy is over the law of heaven. And we've been looking at the law as well. We know four and six. We've been looking at the law. It's, it's the law of love. But it's not just about God. And as Adventists, we focused on Sabbath. This will be a physical test about Sabbath and Sunday. And it's that simple. People will just have to choose a day. And we haven't connected ideology to that. We haven't connected. How do people think to even get to that day? We just thought, well, they won't. We've had it on a simplistic level. They won't be able to buy and sell. So they'll just be forced into it. Or they worship the Catholic Church and they see that they do Sunday. So they will just go with some. We've kind of made it very simplistic. And that doesn't take in all the rest of the world that like we've been looking at now all these atheists out there who what do they believe where are they coming from what side are they going to choose and why so now we're looking deeper into how people are thinking behind the law of god and we're seeing the last six and we're saying how do humans interact and why and this is why we're going into government because government is elected by the people and is a reflection of how the people think and now we're looking at government and how they rule the world we can get a good idea of how those people think over there the majority of them to put that government in place so it's all about governing and the law and the law of god's kingdom and what it looks like so we know that now it's a law of love but it's a law of equality and when it comes to how man interacts with each other because when we interact with god we had focused on sabbath and worshiping him but when we interact with man we see it's all about equality and we didn't see that so then it it, it moved us if we go back to the midnight cry I also wanted to put in there a Bible quote. This is Jeremiah. So this has been God's problem all the way along. And he talks about it in terms of water. So we say that when the midnight cry arrived, what was the message in 2018 that we got? That we, I was asking, focusing on a bit in the Vespers, what would we say that actually got delivered to us? 
two streams. Okay, so two streams. We're going to get that in our heads. And I want us to see these two streams. So these streams is an information war. So we have two streams, and we have a, you know, we have a stream coming in from one side. We have a stream coming in from the other side. And these these are two streams. Right? It doesn't look that obvious. It's like they're actually probably quite mingled and running together, really. But for the purpose of this exercise, we'll have two streams of information. And Jeremiah warns about this, God's people. This was a problem back then at the time of the Old Testament. If we turn to Jeremiah 2.13, the context is quite good. I don't want to spend too much time reading the context, but he's telling Israel off, basically. And before we read the verse 13, as we get to it, well, let's read 13. For my, actually, someone else can read that. Daisy, have you got it? 2.13, thanks. So what's what are you getting from that? It's interesting. It's kind of one of my favorite verses, um, <clears throat> but it seems like the two issues that are in. in for example, what am I getting directly just from reading yeah. what just read? There's two evils. One is the forsaken God, and the other one is they've created themselves like a another system or something else to so God is the God is the living fountain of living water. So they've rejected that and now they've made their own sort of fountain or system. And obviously the system's not really it just collect rainwater, isn't it? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's not fit for purpose, so they've made themselves another kind of system to gain water. Mm. Um, yeah, I'm just on a simple level. So if we do if we do this, the stream this side, if we say the fountain of living waters is this side, and we've got broken systems mm. here. And this is a famous book in Adventism called Living Fountains of Broken Systems that Sutherland wrote about the education system and how the education system in most schools was Greek and Roman, and we need to have our own as Adventists, seeing that we're drinking from the wrong stream of information. And, and that's what I'm getting from this in, in the light of our message is, yes, there's two streams and there's two evils in in, the, in Israel at this time that they have not only forsaken the living stream, but they've hewed out systems, broken ones that can't hold water. So an assistant was a water tub that would hold water. So presumably this is, is, is a leaky vessel. Um, and they've made it themselves. So I'm getting several things from there. This is man-made. This is not living fountains. It's man-made. It's not holding the water properly. And it's not that they've just left God. They've done something instead of to put in place of it. And when you look at um, the argument for verse 8, it says the priests and the pastors have transgressed. So the religious teachers are teaching the wrong thing. Verse 11 says they've changed. The nation has changed their gods, which are yet no gods. They're not real gods, but the people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Mm -hmm. This is the glorious land, which has changed the glory for something that doesn't profit and doesn't save you. So this is America changing its gods, changing its ideology, I'm going to say, and rejecting God in the process. And these two evils, they've forsaken him, the fountain of living waters. Q, he put out, like Daniel 2, so they're putting out their own ideology, their own exactly yeah they've cut out their own thoughts and when you yes definitely hewed out and, and in compare and contrasting what's um what else comes to mind any other compare and contrast when you look at that and you say fountain of living waters and broken systems is there a difference in the in that this is not a polluted stream although it is it doesn't say it's not quite the same wording, is it? That this is a container for holding water. So they've not only they've hewed it out and made it themselves, it's a leaky vessel. But in contrast, what does living waters conjure up to you? If it's living, what do people see when you see fountain of living waters? What's happening with the water? Yeah. So what's the difference between a fountain and a system? Yeah, what is the difference? Do you have any ideas? So a living fountain to me is something that's flowing forth continuously and it's clean like a stream it's giving, yeah, which is whereas a cistern is sitting there collecting the rainwater. So it's still, they can still get water from it, but they're going to do this man, they're going to have to do it themselves manually. This is not flowing forth. And if it's flowing forth, it's broken, it's leaking out. 
So this is not, it's not, it, to me, it's not living, it's not vibrant, it's not alive, it's flowing. dead. Yes, that's, yeah, bottom line. And although the system should be flowing, there should be some kind of pipe or mechanism for you to get that water. Maybe there isn't, maybe there's just a cup. It's a man-made thing that collects the rain. So and, because it's flowing, does it mean it's in living water? Mm -hmm. So that means the other one must be... De dead water dead water. Yeah. dead water like a stagnant pond that's the idea i'm getting so when you get rainwater sitting there you get flies in it you get things going in it nothing's cleaning it out like a like the dead sea it's just sitting there and then but the flowing water's got water coming in and out and it's just moving it's alive in contrast but this has been a problem for ancient israel that they're drinking from the wrong source and he's, it says um they're worshiping false gods what did it say about so the main problem is found with the living water. That's the first evil. And the second one is the, the clean out broken system. So it's about the survival of dead water. Yeah. Go on. Um, I'm trying to connect, connect this to the idea of you know two streams of information and what it's living and still dead water would mean in the context of uh, streams of information. I don't know if it's a stretch to say that drinking from living water, this continuous stream of information is a reflection of God's character and that it's just continuously learning about this character of God that we have, as opposed to broken systems, which have this set of ideas and that's it. It's fixed in place and which describes the layer of the same condition yeah. of Okay, you read how God operates in the Old Testament, and that's God. It's done. It's not living. It's dead. Once you pass that dispensation, um, yeah, I don't know. That's Since God compared Himself to the fountain of living water, so He says, "I am that fountain of living water." So that means, but that mean if God could be one stream, that means the other one. Yes, and if you see that, if you go back to verse 8, it says, um, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that do not profit. So that's the other stream then. So that's the other, yes. So it's not the fact they've just left God and just gone out there. They've got another system now they've put in place instead. They've replaced him with something system else. Information. System of information, false ideology. They're worshipping Baal now. So they're going the extra mile. It's one thing to leave the faith, but it's another thing to set up a satanic worship system and say, everybody do this instead. It's like, it's a complete. It's Is just... it always that, that contrasted in the same, like um, when we speak about the eggs, or we say that Israelites thought they were worshipping God, but instead what happened was they were worshipping the idea of who God actually was. But what we're reading kind of like, puts across the message that they left God and say, God, that's you, you know, we're going to create this whole new God compared to the Israelites who believe they were worshipping that God. So is it always one or the other? Or is it one or the other? Or do they operate together? And and I'm not sure what the question is. If you don't worship God, then you have to worship another God. Yeah. Like, it's, um, what, what I got from, from what we read now is that they neglected God. They said, God, you know, you're on your own. I'm going to create my own God. In comparison to the Israelites who believed they were worshiping God. So, yes, they created a new God, but in their mind, they didn't think they created a new God. Right? So those are the two different options. So I'm asking is what we're describing, which one of those two are they? Is it a stream of information that believes they're worshiping the right God? Or is it one that actively rejects God and creates the God? Yes, yeah. So I think so, so I think I think what you're saying is that there were Israelites who said, right, we're just gonna leave God now, we're gonna go and worship Baal. Mm -hmm. In this passage, that's what they've done. So have they rejected God outright? Mm -hmm. And then there's people who are still in Israel and thinking that God wants them to say, offer their children to idols, and that's yeah. worshiping the true God. Do you do you understand some way? Sorry, Rayan, Israel. 
I think in this paragraph, if we just say these people have said, we don't want God, we want to go worship Baal, we're just going to worship Baal, and they're in total rebellion. Or there's a group of Israelites that say, we want to worship God, and it's Apis Bull. We, we think we are serving God, and in essence, they're both on the wrong side, but they are professing something different. They're saying, we think this is the way to worship God. But it's very similar, because of the golden calf, they think, let's make a golden calf to God and worship it, and thinking that, did they think God would be happy with that? And then Moses comes out and says, no, he's not happy with this, what are you doing? And I think many of them did probably think he would be happy with that. Mm-hmm. Sorry, Daisy, to your point. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think I get what um, Kat is saying about it, it can like, on first look, it can look like they've rejected God and gone after like someone else. But when I look at the verse, the common theme for the vote is water. So someone could go to a broken system and drink like take a cup and they'll say, I'm still drinking water, I'm still worshiping God. So I think it's that I think it's a case where they've created a broken system and they're saying this is actually the worship of the true God. And it reminds me a little bit of like the whole COVID situation, like people's reactions to it. And you know, a lot of people really a lot of people really feel they're doing God's service by even little things like not wearing a mask. Like I have a friend that I bumped into you know, like we still wear, they were like, why are you wearing that? And they actually think it's a good thing to actually go to the supermarket without a mask because they think that's what making a stand for God is. Where I'm like, okay, I'm putting on a mask because I don't know who I'm going to interact with. So I see that as God's service. Mm. So definitely, yeah, I agree yeah. with <clears throat> what Kat is there. Mm. So there are people out there who are doing it thinking they're worshiping God, mm. and that's the, that's the biggest delusion. So it seems to me that this track of truth and is coming it's coming so close to one another you know we talk about the track of truth and error coming close that and it almost get intermingled for some people but the truth will always say separate and the true stream is very narrow and there's so much pollution out there like we say it's muddied the waters that the truth we know truth and error is more powerful than just error by itself that it's just and i think that's what we're learning as the message grows it's not that simple like we thought it was so before we thought it was Adventists against the whole world or against Catholicism. And now we're seeing, actually, is it Adventists against Catholicism? It isn't, because when we looked at Protestantism, we recognized Adventists are like Catholics. They're, they're like, a, they are apostate Protestants. So they're not against, they're not, how are they going to have this fight? Um, so, and then the promise in Revelation 7, 17 is the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them into living fountains of waters and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. So in heaven, we'll have the true stream only. So we won't have to worry about this error stream that's coming in. Um, so from the Millerite message, then we've developed from the, mid- the simple midnight cry message into a more complex midnight cry message in the sense of Boston, Concord and Exeter. So we see now with our line of 144,000, which we know is 1989. And then we have 9-11. And what's next? Okay. We have our five way marks and our four dispensations. What's that? Sunday law. Sunday law. Uh, next one. Mm-hmm. COP. And second advent. And we see that in between each one of those, we have these two way marks, which we got originally from the midnight cry of Boston and Exeter. So we have the increase of knowledge. And a formalization and we know for us that was Raphia and Panion. So this is 2019 and this is 2021 and we know we're in Panion and the next step is the Sunday law. So we're right near the end and this is our midnight cry time period which is swelling into the Sunday law. So we are, I think are in the agitation, would everyone say that agitation of the Sunday law? time period, that's where we are. So things are being agitated in the world now in connection with our message. So in 2018, where were we? When we talk about left wing and right wing, as a movement, we were conservative and we were, which one were we? We were right wing. So we started out right wing. We had right wing ideology. What did that look like? Right wing ideology, conservative. What else, what would we, what we did we believe? Just, uh, I would um, specify like socially conservative. Yeah. yeah, these ideas that a Republican would, would believe in. 
socially um, with regards to the ethos of the nation. How do we believe characters should be? It's very, uh, yeah, not public. So yeah, so we had, I think some of the things that Elmer Sess had said were the Bible, morality and traditional values. USA was a glorious land, you know, it's a, as a nation, it's great. We had views about Islam, conservative family values, and that the com, um, capitalist economy, we still, she had the Islam in there in that list of things we believed. I think these were the things people were throwing out about us as a, I, I don't know how that fits in with right wing and left wing specifically. Yeah. I think, um, I, I, does anybody have any thought on that? Uh, a capitalism as an economy. This is where we were as a conservative right wing. Oh, oh, that's what we were. That's what we were. I think we were probably on the side of big government, if yeah, you put it that, the, sorry, small government, small government, as opposed to big government, which is a ideology in the sense of, um, she breaks that down later. I think these are the things people threw out that I don't think we understood it then. I don't, I'm not sure if we had a position on that, but the, the FFA in America were Republican basically, and a Republican is for small government over big one. And small government is needed because you don't need to enforce so many laws about equality, so much to, to make businesses do what you want them to do. It's more freedom of individuals to do what they want in business and things like that. So I think that's what the, the capitalist mindset is. You know, if you're a businessman entrepreneur, you can go out and start your business and run it how you want, have employ who you want, do what you want. And left wing would say, no, we need more laws to say there need to be minority people employed or women, or, you know, we're going to start restri restricting you or making laws about how you run your business. And it's basically white supremacy um, when you look at it in America. And I think that's, exactly. that's where we were as a movement without realizing it, male dominated white headship model, which has so built us over into capitalism. Would you think about states rights and things like that as it was? I don't know, probably, yeah. This whole state and federal level, you know, states making their own laws was what the Civil War was about as well. We in the southern states should be allowed to have slaves if we want. Why are you in the north telling us what to do? And it's that whole thing about everyone's free to, to do that. I mean, capitalism has its pluses that people are able to go out. The extreme of it, communism, you're not allowed to do your own business or you, everything's done by the state and you've got that middle ground. But, and I think that's what we're finding with all of it. Come on. That's true. Women's ordination was voted yes in America, but in Africa and places who had the bigger voting power, they said no because of the headship model. But it's still going on countries, wasn't it? Yeah, it's going on in different countries. So I think so. We've shifted from there our ideology, and several things happened to move us to that point. And I don't want to go into them too much. She lists a couple saying that. We learned from history, mainly Protestant history. We began to see that Protestant history wasn't that clear, as clear as we thought it was. And that um, the whole way 1888, for instance, the fear that drove them, they weren't in harmony with the Catholics back then, they hated Catholics. So it wasn't America coming together with Catholics to do anything in 1888 about Sunday law. So we began to unpack that and see that Adventism as its root source is apostate Protestant and that which at its root is Catholic. And so they're all actually, They've all got the wrong ideology, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but the reasons behind it, we began to understand more, and we began to see about the religious right and how they began to get politically motivated in our history and began to push the American government. So we we focused really much on that apostate Christian angle, and then as that unpackaged with Ipsos and the battles of Pyrrhus, we began to see more about the U.S. election in 2016 and that Clinton should have won it, not Trump, based on that battle of Ipsos back in. The Diadochi was, and I'm not going to go into that right now because I'm not sure I fully could explain that at this point, unless anyone else has got anything to say about that. Um, but we had prophetic understanding that led us to see that actually the right wing is not correct anymore, and we need to go to the left now. We need to see what the left is saying because these right wing people are racist, sexist, and we had the line of gender and slavery, and we began to see how that impacted us in the movement that we had a, a white supremacy. Um, a, I guess people with money, power, um, model. And so it began to be, I suppose what we could say is, we began to see that God was left wing, not right wing. And so we were gonna now put right wing over here in the broken system side. 
I'm just going to move ethos for a second. I can't, this pen is not very good for this. Sorry. Let me fix that flip chart one. No, I've got one now. Sorry, I've, 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 I used the one out of the packet instead of my own, which is what I probably meant to do. Um, so we could put right wing here. And um, something else left in the right wing. And then as we began to study, it unfolded, it became more complex than that. You can't just put right wing, left wing, and think that everything that side is okay and everything this side is not okay. And as we started to look more deeply into that, we began to see that there is more to the story. What happened in, in Raffia? What light did we get in Panion that we didn't have in Raffia? So what was the increase of knowledge here? So we had two streams here from 2018. And what light came in 2019? What is our message now, would we say? Gender, so it's connected to gender. No, no, feminism. So we had feminism here. And then by the time it came to the formalization in 2021, what did we realize? Radical. It's radical feminism. So that's just like the right wing left wing argument. We have put feminism over here. And now we've arrived, we've got left wing feminists. And over here, they are. Um, let's say anti-feminism and then as we began to study it more as we as it opened up a bit more we realized you can't even say that because feminism has to be radical it's not just cultural liberal feminism it's radical feminism god i may be a little excuse me i may be a little controversial but what i'm going to ask but you know all what's been going on leading up to where we are right now this has been laid out by the world of the people. Mm -hmm. And our part has just been observers and doing what we're doing right now. And we're coming right up to Sunday law. And we're still like, you know, blooming to the world. You know, I, I'm just wondering what impact and how we are going to become the light of the world. So Brian's question is, how are we going to become the light of the world? And what is our role in this as God's people? Because we're in oblivion and the world is directing yeah. this argument. Let's think back to 1888 and let's think back to even 1844. What was directing the argument, or 1850, 1863? What was directing the argument in the 1860s? So, so who was pushing the whole civil war thing? Was it Adventists? No, no. no. So in the 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law, which we say was the Sunday law now, was nothing to do with us. This was all generated by the slaves escaping and then the whites helping them in the north and then saying, and then the government passes these laws about, you know, you're not allowed to help the slaves. So they had to see all that, but it wasn't driven by them. 1888, what was the threat in 1888? Yes, Adventists were a bit of a threat, but it was the Catholics, the Jews, the free thinkers, atheists, we might call them now, who were coming into America and we've got to stop these people. And it's the apostate Christian world who are saying, we need a Sunday law to stop these people, part of their argument. They had immigration arguments too. It wasn't just about Sunday, but we as Adventists honed in on the Sunday and said that was about us. And then we see A.T. Jones going to Congress, one man going to Congress, and we say, the Adventists were fighting and standing up for Sabbath. And he was arguing for a lot more than Sabbath. It was just liberty, principles of liberty of conscience and how you hold your views and what you do with them. We're not going to legislate them in government. So he's doing similar arguments to what we're doing now about what's right to legislate and what isn't. Do a government have a right to dictate what happens to a woman's body? And all that's going on. And Jones happens to go to Congress and we make a big thing about it, but that's all going on without Adventists. Mm -hmm. So Adventists aren't the center of that controversy. We make them the center when we look at 1888. And now we come here and we go, well, actually it's not that different. The whole world is being agitated by these issues. And we're looking on with a prophetic understanding going, how do we, which side are we on? How do we navigate this? How do we tell other people to navigate this? And I think that's really important. They were, where were the Adventists in 1850? Where were the Adventists in 1888? Who was this light of the world? Who was this movement? Who was this church? What were they doing? You know, it's like, okay, so I think we are, we've learned in the movement that we are less than, we are nobody. We've actually been humbled in the dust, which was an Elder Jeff phrase, but it's actually true. We are nothing. And we're beginning to see that actually this isn't going to look like we thought. What is this going to look like? I don't know. But I do know that this isn't 
a model any different really than what's happened in history before? Um, I, I don't know. I, I have the exact same question. In fact, it's one of the questions I was going to send to the other team. But I think it's hard looking at those histories primarily because they're histories of failure. Mm -hmm. And if we are to, if we did look at the history of success, the disciples in Christ were this, you know, really small group in the entirety of the Roman kingdom. They were a minority. Yes. And it's only until Pentecost that they blew up. Um, and did a mission to, in their use case, evangelize the world. Mm -hmm. um, or they took the gospel to the world. Yeah. And that only happened in a history of success. And those two histories of failure, they remained nobodies, these adventists, mm -hmm. because they failed at their mission. Well, not, yeah, you get what I mean by saying they failed. Um, so what it looks like today might not look exactly like how it did in 1988 and 1850. Yes, and even if we say a history of success, when we look at the disciples and we say 3,000, mm -hmm. when we look at this movement, we think 3,000 sounds an awful lot. But in Jerusalem at that time, that was a tiny amount of people. Yeah. And, the, yeah. and the disciples were nobodies. They were not educated. They were not known. They were actually enemies of the church. So they were outcasts. And then when they went traveling around the world, we have the Bible account, which makes them huge mm -hmm. to us, the be all and the end all. Yeah. And yet when they went somewhere like Greece, who paid them, how much attention was actually paid to them? You know, was this a little town over here in Wales where some little preaching was done and yeah. we make a huge deal of it. Like we'd make a huge deal of how we talk about this movement maybe, but we're like a handful. Go on. If I can see them by and by, I think the message I was trying to bring is to encourage people to see And we do have a different message to what the world, even though it looks the same when you look at what you're saying when you look into the world. You can take that because feminism, for an example, we think differently than men in the world. We do have a different message, and it's to bring us to the Sunday Lord, to bring hearts from God's people in the church. And then once the Sunday Lord arrives, we have the empowerment of our Catholic message to be brought by Revelation 18, that means that um, something big will happen there where her message will be empowered and that's going to be seen by the world. There's coming a, a time I think I don't know how that scene is going to look like but um but I know we have to God's purpose at this point is to settle us into what is this fountain of living waters because we very quickly jump onto it just like in all through history you know when when um the reformation comes about and they say yes righteousness by faith we've got it now we've got it all sorted and then they, then someone else comes along like um says we need baptism by immersion and they're going, oh, I don't know about that. We sprinkle it's, you know, so then they go, okay, let's be Baptists. And then the Methodists come. John Wesley says, no, we need a method, we need sanctification. You can't just be baptized by immersion. And the Baptists say, no, we've got baptism, we're stopping here. And the Methodists come and say, no, you need Methodism as well. You need more than that. And some of the Adventists come and say, you need the Sabbath as well. And there's this growth of light and he wants his people to move in it. And it's almost like he's doing that with this generation. So we've gone from conservative right wing, anti-feminism to left wing feminists. And now we're holding that even down saying it's got to be radical feminism it's left-wing ideology but it's not it's and, and then this freedom and equality versus equality argument sorry could you explain what radical or define what radical feminism is compared to normal feminism so there's three types that she talked about but cultural we don't really have to i don't think go in cultural feminism is where the papacy is at which is basically Women should be in the home, they should be mothers, they're nurturing and caring, and we need more of those kind of characters in the Catholic Church. So he will say, yes, we need women to do things, but we need their caring motherly instinct. So we need them to have children. If they don't have children, they're not really a woman. And just stay in their cultural position in society as a woman and mother. So we're really dealing with liberal feminism and radical. And liberal feminism says, yes, women should have education. Yes, they should get jobs. Yes, they can come out of the home, that's okay. But, um, they, would, they can wear what they want, it's their choice. So they can wear high heels and wear makeup and do those things. And it's their, it's their decision to do that. And it's good for them to do that because they choose and they've got freedom to do that. So it's all about freedom and freedom to what else is to wear and do what they want. But it's also, um, any other, it also, Daisy? It, it also, um, <clears throat> basically, it's very like um, capitalist driven. So it puts, it almost puts, um, how about saying it? The standard becomes the man, and what um, liberal feminism does 
it's almost like it is pushing women to achieve the same standards as men. Right. Does that make sense? So it makes a man the standard and women should come up to that standard. So that's what it does. So that's why there's with people feminism, there's this whole push about women being bosses and all of those things, because it's 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 promoting success or promoting manly traits as that's how you get successful. You can become like a man, that's how you become successful. So that's why it plays into things like capitalism and things like that. So that's that's one angle on it because the other angle says that you should dress like a woman and wear the makeup and the jewellery and you've got the sex industry it's okay to do porn it's okay to be a prostitute that's your choice and you should be free to make that choice as a woman you, you can choose that and that's what liberation means for women a freedom for women means that they can choose whatever path they want to take and if they want to be in porn or they want to be so there's things that they say that we wouldn't agree with but they would also say let's change the law let's let's go to the government and say make laws for women to protect them so they would make political decisions but it's very much more individual. It's not the collective. But the, the basic difference between that and radical feminist is the radical feminist says, no, that's not enough just to change the laws. Those are symptoms. The root of the problem is what? Ideology. Ideology. And what's the root of the problem with feminism, with the whole argument about feminism? What would we say was the underlying sin of patriarchy? So they're saying the big problem we have in society is patriarchy and headship we, we're going to put headship in there as christian because that is the whole model the bible is based on is patriarchal and they're saying the sin is is patriarchy this is the radical feminist and they're saying it's not enough just to change these laws it's not enough to stop wearing the makeup or stop shaving the legs or doing whatever it is that women have to do in society to be attractive and to be successful we have to change the system it's broken so they're saying the system is broken it doesn't work and it's never going to work because you've always got men over women in a powerful position and that headship model that patriarchal system where the man leads out and he's the head of the home and the head of the government we have to shift that thinking we have to change that for women ever to be equal so they're about lifting up the grassroots of society and saying we just got to change the whole system it's not working so that's where we would agree with them on Go on, how it makes sense to me is um how someone described it as as a radical feminist you start questioning why things are the way they are yeah so um like for you the example you gave is the porn industry a liberal feminist will say you know a woman can be involved in porn because it's her choice yeah but a radical feminism will say okay but why do we have that industry in the first place largely to an extent it's to gratify men it's to please men. Yeah. Um, why do women shave and men don't? You know, um, they question all these reasons as why, why do, why is makeup largely sold to women and not men? Why is, yeah, it just questions why behind all these things, understand why. And when we, the result of that question is to trace it back to the system in which it was all built on top of. A patriarchy to please me um yeah so it boils back down to the fact that men are in power and culturally it's been cultivated from birth in all of us the gender roles and those gender roles lead to the woman being the caring nurturing mother and the husband or the father figure being in government and leadership and power so he's the one that's capable of doing that and so that's when you start saying it's biology and that's why she brings in the gendered brain argument because it's, it's this whole argument about are they born that way or are they become that way and radical feminists would say they become that way because society is patriarchal and we would agree with that um sorry can i prefix my statement yes um when i say to please men i know i know that you know like that's not what a woman thinks you know when she dresses yeah because uh you often get the statement are oh, you wearing those clothes because you just want to, you know, show me your boobs. Or, or, you know, I am just prefixing that that's not what's in a woman's mind. And I'm more talking about the system in place. Uh, yeah. That at its root, it really is about pleasing men and women. We don't, we don't see that. We've been taught that, you know, it's about looking good or, you know, pleasing ourselves or pleasing other women or something, but pleasing ourselves. But we don't, yeah, we don't see the root of it, why we have to do that or why we're conditioned to behave and look like that. Yeah, sure, someone can. Yeah. I don't either. Sorry. Somebody can turn the heating on. <laughs> Magic did it before. It's a, just a button in the back. Did you see? You didn't know how to do it. Do I have it? Sorry.
I don't know if we can put, so we're going to put these in brackets perhaps, so I was going to rub them off because it's loosely anti feminism right wing and loosely feminism in left wing. But what we're seeing now is actually unraveled that, that we began to see that there's problems with the left wing. So we moved from right wing streams of information, so from Fox News to CNN, and we saw that there are people, as Brian made out, that this is this whole thing is going on in the world, and people are following streams in the world. So they're following Michael Moore, Bernie Sanders, AOC, and these are left wing Democrat kind of side politicians. But we recognise there's problems with them. So someone like AOC, Alexander Ocasio Cortez, what her name is, is high up in the Democrats, and she's but she's not radical feminist. She's makeup, jewellery, has to wear that to be attractive. And we contrasted her with Michael Moore, who's overweight with a cap on back to front, looking like he's just got out of bed. And he could be successful looking like that, but she couldn't. She would never be successful if she didn't look sexy, attractive, you know, by that line. So we began to see that there's, it's not that straightforward. That's just one example. She also took us back to history and showed how Martin Luther, Calvin, Knox, they were sexist, racist, and yet they were reformers used by God. And so they weren't, they weren't as good as we made them out and the Pope as bad. And that's to make them both bad, not the Pope good. So, it, and then abolitionists, we go back to the history of the Civil War and we see the blacks and whites in the South and we see the, the North and how they're abolitionist, but it's not because they are pro-black. They wanna send the blacks back to Africa. They are actually just as racist almost, but they have their own motivation for being abolitionist. So it's not as pure, the streams are not as pure on either side in the world as we thought they were. And I think that's what we need to take on board now. And so what she's doing now is we're unpackaging the another stream. We're seeing that it's broader than just a religious controversy, that there are many people in the world who can come together on certain issues because of their ideology. And that's, yes. And COVID was a prime example. Yeah, people standing up. So it's explaining. So COVID is a good example of what? Like what you just that point you just made it wasn't just a religious thing it wasn't just the church people that were you know you didn't have to have a religion to be anti COVID anti lockdown mm. and things like that. Oh yes, and a lot of more new age people were anti COVID yeah. anti lockdown anti vaccine. Yeah. Mm. So what we're seeing now is this, this, these streams are different ideologies, and under those ideologies comes different things. So before we would have said this is Catholicism and this is Adventism, and now we're saying on this side. There's a lot more to it than just being Catholic or just being apostate Protestant, a false religion. That there's this side of teaching it like a religion. And it's it came out in that article with the Max article. So that's why we went to the Max article. So I just wanted to read. So the COVID pandemic has been a good case study on this subject and how left and right wing approach freedom and equality differently. So then she unraveled it and said that it's freedom and equality. So we could put now this side's ideology is freedom over equality and this side is equality over freedom. So both sides believe in equality and both sides believe in freedom. But when they come to it, if you're going to choose one or the other, this side will choose freedom over equality, and this side will choose equality over freedom. Curtis. And I think, sorry, that answers the question as to how we distinguish between radical feminism and liberal feminism. Where liberal feminism describes you have the freedom to do what you want as an individual, which we believe in, you know, we believe mm -hmm. in freedom. Yes, freedom but of choice. Radical feminism will say, yeah, but when the two collide, choose equality. So what I mean by that is if your decisions impact you, look at how they impact society as well. So um, that's not really equality because you're putting you ahead of the collective. Mm -hmm. Whereas radical feminism is more worried about everyone else as well as themselves within that community. So the example is porn. You know, it's just the easiest example to use, sorry. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, a liberal feminist will say, it's my choice to be involved in this industry. But a radical feminist will say, okay, yeah, sure, fair and fine. But look at how porn influences men in society to treat women. And you, you read of case studies after case studies of the impact porn has on men and their wives or men and women aggression violence. aggression violence yeah. um etc etc assault and so by you choosing to do that 
your impact in society yeah because you're part of the problem now but yeah whereas the radical will say just don't do it so that you don't be part of the problem don't compound the problem yeah, yeah. Make it worse. and apply it to all the other things in life um, that we can list as yeah yeah so i think you have to see that 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 patriarchy leads to that aggression that oppression that that um violence against women and i think that's where it's and the harassment that that started at gamergate so we well became more public at gamergate so what you just said was interesting too freedom i think is for you it's freedom for me as an individual the people that are in power will get the freedom but it's not for other people love your neighbor it's yeah. all about me it's not about everyone else and if i think about everyone else i think oh that's not that's equality and that's where god wants to take us the selfless and this is selfish and so yeah this if we pitted it down now it's probably it's not even that simple as freedom of equality but that's where the, it's coming together because as adventists traditionally we've always thought we have to stand up for freedom of conscience the sabbath issue is about me being free to choose how i worship god so we focused on freedom big time. That's our message. We need to stand up to be free. And, and we realize now how that's being used by the enemy as it's so close to the track of truth. And so many Adventists are going to stand up for what they think is freedom, like not wearing a mask. I'm free to choose not to wear a mask when they're going against what God's will is. And, and it's eight, eight years, you know, he was maybe saying, no, it's freedom of conscience for everyone. For these Jews, or the free um, thinkers, these free thinkers. So it was him loving his neighbor. Yes. It was you guys aren't treating society as equals, yeah. you're valuing yourselves by choosing this day of worship over everyone else's. He never approached it from a Seventh day Adventist perspective, from a Sabbath, you know, perspective. When he's doing it on there. No, that's right. It's for everyone else. Did you find it? No. Magic knows how to do the heating. Sorry, he put it on earlier. I didn't look at it. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the, the COVID pandemic and how the left wing approach freedom and equality differently. And we saw that left priorities equality over freedom and the right wing priorities freedom over equality. Democrats, Democrats generally it's equality and Republicans generally a freedom. And we could have left it there. So we had Democrats and Republicans. And now we've brought in a third party. And who is that? Do you know, Courtney? Do you? The Libertarians. So the Libertarians are, are a party, but they're more than a party. So they're the third largest political party in America, but they're an ideology, which, as Elder Tess has traced it, is actually permeating the right and the left wing. So there are left wing Libertarians because they believe in freedom. And we would say freedom is in both sides. We, these people should be free as well to make choices and things. Equality includes freedom for everyone. Um, so there are libertarians on both sides, but the libertarian faction on the right side has become radicalized. And that's where she's going with all these, um, the Proud Boys, these militia groups are becoming radicalized on this side for freedom under this um, libertarian theology, which is you should be free to do what you want, free to speak out, free speech is where it's being pitted, really. So you're free to speak about what you want. Even if I don't agree with what you're saying, you can say, I hate homosexuals if you want to, for instance, and I don't agree with it, but, but you're right as a citizen to have free speech gives you a right to be able to speak like that. Um, so the right-wing dominionist Protestant package is a bit different from a libertarianism. So a libertarian will support gay marriage, open, opposes church and state, and generally speaking wants to defund the police and, and the war on drugs. So we need to understand a right-wing libertarianism and how that impacts our movement. And this is why we're looking at Max. So when we looked at this I thought Max is interesting because Max is just the name of a man who holds these this false position. And when you think Max is the shortened version of Maximum, and I think Maximum people in the world, the most people in the world probably believe this can, are going to go down this false stream. Sorry, uh, standing from he stands for a much larger group of people. Um, so there's three things that are brought out about Max in this article. So what are the three his three ideologies basically? Do we know what they are? He's libertarian and he's atheist. And what's the first one? Men's rights. So he's for men's rights and he's atheist and he's libertarian. So I'm going to put them, I don't know if we put some more underneath, but so this is the point I want to kind of end up on. This is where she's summarizing in last week's festival. I don't know if there's been one this week, but libertarianism is how did he get to be like that? And what does that look like? So why is he atheist? If we were just to give a, um, a summary, I'll do the atheism first, then we'll go to libertarian and, and men's rights. 
Why is he atheist? What is the issue with atheism? Um, it could be him or the wider group of people that are atheists. What's the reasons why people might be atheist? How does he argue? Because people of religion are crazy. Yeah. <laughs> he said people who are religious are crazy. <laughs> That's absolutely true. So what, it's not absolutely true. It's absolutely what they believe to be true. The logic, yeah, the logic is correct. Um, I think from the article, from what his perspective, it was that um, the atheist group Okay, so religion causes the issue of restriction. So let's go to the, the this term atheism now. That's new atheism. So we have new atheism. Let's put that over here. And what is new atheism? When did that come about? Does anyone know the date that came about with Mark? So atheism up to this point was a belief that people didn't believe in God, basically. That's what atheists were. They were just people that didn't believe in God. They weren't like organized as a group or anything. They may have had atheistic societies, but they weren't didn't have a voice in like a as a movement. Yeah. I don't know the specific Yeah. I don't know the specific date, but what isn't it the 90s to early 2000s? Yes. So basically. What triggered a lot of it was 2011, but 2004, I think they would mark the term new atheism as coined in 2006. So it's around 2006, but the history of that is, is a couple of things happened. One was 9-11, and it's particularly these four men. So it was a reaction to September 11th. This is radical Islam, and they are against radical Islam. And it said, Sam Harris writes this book in 2004 called The End of Faith. So... 2004, Sam Harris writes this book, um, The End of Faith, and the title's a bit longer than that, I think. So it says, um, The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason. So it's quite a lot there. That sounds like an 18th century title. You know, <laughs> don't normally have that long a title. So it's The End of Faith, Religion, Terror, and the Future of Reason. This book became a bestseller in the USA. Um, then a few more books came out by atheistic authors. Sam Harris was very critical of Islam and Christianity and Judaism. He wrote the book because of 9-11. So this is based on, so the end of faith, maybe we should put the rest of it, um, religion and terror, at least we should put the terror in there because it was all about the terror of 9-11. So that was his catalyst of writing the book. And he basically argued it was a, so he's writing this on 9-12. So the next day after September 11th, he's writing, it was a direct response to 9-11. They believe that religion is, religion is at the root of global conflict and that harm done in the world today. He starts targeting religion. Um, and people are then challenging that in response. So people are challenging it because the closest the world got to annihilation was the Cold War. And you see there's no religion in there. This is communism versus the West. This is not about religion and North Korea, Stalin and Putin, who are not religious. So there's, there's arguments people can bring to say it's not about religion, um, but it suits their purposes to this, say it's religious. 2006, Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion. By now, people, he writes a book called The God Delusion. By now, people are giving a name to this new wave of atheism. Four leading atheists get together in one of their homes for a two hour video discussion. And what did they call that? The four horsemen. So these four horsemen get together in 2000, and, what year was that? Eight, I think. 2006. Eight. I don't actually know. Do you know? 2008. I'll just put a question mark there. Four horsemen. And they've become known as the leaders of the atheistic movement since then. Does, does everybody know that there was a woman invited to that as well? Yes. And she was, she fled Somalia. Um, from an arranged Islamic marriage, and she turned against Islam because of it and hated Islam. So she's become atheistic in the light of, and many women in the world are atheists because of that. And you can see why they hate patriarchy, they hate Islam, and they become atheists. So they, she's with them, but she couldn't turn up at that event. So um, she's not kind of included in that list. And do we know the names? Sam Harris. Can we say them? Daniel Dennett, Daniel Dennett Richard Hawkins, yeah, Christopher yeah. Hitchens. Yeah, D. Dennett, yeah, that's Daniel Dennett. One of them is dead, I think it's Hitchens now. But in The Guardian, Hitchens said there was a holy war was the greatest existential threat to civilization. Um, 
And this is one of the reasons why they agreed with going to war with Iraq, because they said that they're fighting a holy war, basically against Islam. Um, atheism is broader than just what Dawkins says. It's about evolution and how women and men developed over millennia. We need to see the link between atheism and libertarianism. So his argument, one of his arguments, I think this is Hitchens, is that American women are making a big deal over nothing. It's all about free speech. Um, that they should really get over the fact that they've gone through the feminist movement and that now it's about men's rights. Men need to be able to have free speech and speak out. So they're trying to understand 9-11 in its context. They're trying to understand the Iraq war and religion in society. As religion is losing power in the US and secularism is growing, a large proportion of young men are following this thought of philosophy. So they're tired of religion and they see wars you know, this whole phrase, religion causes wars, which people use all the time, and they're moving into this secular viewpoint. And this is leading them into men's rights. So what are the some of the arguments? So they're basically saying that religion causes wars. This is one of the things that being hated. So what's another argument they have against religion? I think kind of Brian alluded to that, that people are crazy, that it's irrational that it's um, irrational, unscientific, and emotional. And emotional to be religious. It's, got, it's old fashioned and outdated and nobody believes that stuff anymore. Um, yes, unscientific, can't be proven, yeah. Let's see if there's anything else we have for that. Libertarian. Okay, so I know we've only got five minutes. Let's, um, yeah, just want to do the men's rights. So what are the arguments they've got for men's rights? What are the reasons why they are anti-women? I got about. It's also the belief that women's rights are taking away men's rights. So okay. it's now, they are the victims. So allow more women in the world. Okay, I'll give them to this whole world. So, yeah. I like the picture of those any about children. Children can basically reverse everything. Yeah. So they want to. Um, key points about gender and how he and the faction views gender. He thinks women already have vote rights. Go on. Also, oh, like voting civil rights has been accomplished for women. So that why are they still harping on about feminism when the feminist movement has been and gone, um, and now it's time for men. Women over men and oppress them in society, there's reverse discrimination. So they're arguing that women are now, like you say, giving women, women rights is taking away the men's and it's putting the women in a powerful position over them. Yeah. Um, feminism is like a religion. It's based on the idea that there is no rational thought in gender equality. So they're seeing feminism. as equal to religion. And what do they think about religion? It's irrational, unscientific, and emotional. And that's what this feminist organization is. I mean, who can believe in that? It's just, it's nonsense. Indoctrination. So they're seeing it as a religion, feminism. And, the, and the, I think one of the most important ones is, is this intrinsic differences. So this is one of their arguments. And this goes back to, so what's intrinsic and extrinsic differences? Biology. This is biology. So this is the argument that... So I'm going to put biology there. So when I say that you're know, intrinsic, it means belonging to the very nature of the thing, not dependent on external circumstances. It's essential, inherent. It did not come from birth, upbringing or society. You're born that way, basically. So um, it's not dependent on externals around me. Inerrant means existing in someone as a natural and inseparable quality characteristic or right. So they say that women have intrinsic strengths and weaknesses and men have intrinsic strengths and weaknesses. This is the base of their argument. So you're born a woman, you're naturally a caregiver, you're naturally nurturing, you're naturally um, soft, gentle, not aggressive. Um, and the man is naturally born aggressive and strong and able to lead and protect women or protect do whatever they want, basically. Um, and they're more rational, women are more emotional. 
Men are more able to think and intellectual, so they're better quality to lead. And women don't have those qualities. It's all about how you are biologically. Go on. Yes. So gendered brain. So the gendered brain comes out and says scientifically there is no difference between the brain of a man or a woman. And this is science is now proving this that the brains are the same. So you're not born with those intrinsic qualities. What's that? We thank them. <laughs> yes, yeah. The scientists are actually supporting the right side on this one. Well, this woman is. I don't know how much acceptance she's got in the scientific community, but I, mean, I think there's a big backlash because most of the men are. But this is amazing how this is paralleled in the on a counselling course. And Freud is the father of modern day psychology, and he is so misogynistic. And his viewpoint is basically women are animals less than men because you trace it back to. Darwin. Mm -hmm. So this is evolution. And in the evolutionary cycle, men evolved to be a higher state than women. Mm -hmm. So women were less than men, and they're just not capable of doing what men. And he terms the phrase hysteria, which is comes from the Greek word hyster hysteri, which is the womb. Mm -hmm. So it's all about they have these emotional issues because they've got a womb because they're a woman, and they have cycle, menstrual cycle, and and then they're, you know, so he terms the phrase hysterical and hysteria as applied to women and that's stuck that label is stuck that women are hysterical and men are calm and you know emotionally stable and women are unstable and it, it's so sickening because when you see how misogynistic he was he does these studies on children he never spends any time with children because he's a victorian male and the, the women raise the children he makes all these um what's the word theories about the stages of development of a child and relates it to sexual things it's just it, it really is because what it does with the same with attachment theory is put the blame on the mother the mother was not, you know, she breastfed too short. She didn't potty train correctly. The child wasn't attached properly to the mother. That's why they have all these dysfunction later on in life, which is a huge, you know, stress and guilt on the, on the woman, not the man. It's all the woman's fault, basically, even though he doesn't phrase it always like that. But these industries are so male dominated. So intrinsic is something that affects you. Prenatal or postnatal is biological and it's not cultural. And they even see aggression as a strength for men because they had to go out there in the hunter days and protect the home and kill the animals and bring back the hunt. I mean, the whole thing is rooted in Darwinian yeah, theory. So that goes along with not being into religion because they don't believe in a creator God, they believe in, in evolution. So that's how these two can be linked because their theories about women are, are basically evolutionary. And then, go on, any questions? So, <clears throat> all these things that the men do for someone looking from the outside and say, but that's what we see. You know, these are not untruths. No, and that's how, the thing. Yeah, this that, is what we see. That's what we see in society. And yeah. that's, and that's so, what they've been cultivated to behave yeah. like and accept that that's their role. You've been forced into a box and are not even forced, probably led willingly. We're willing slaves. Yeah. We're born that way into a society that says this is what women do this is what men do this is what women wear this is what men wear you know the whole thing is culture cultivated so it is true and that's why the truth and error now is so close because we can start arguing now were we born that way or did society make us that way and then we start wrestling with what's my personality am i this way because of the people i mixed with or am i this way because that's how i was born and what can i change and what can't i change and this is what god is getting us to confront um she's put sorry this chat here it's interesting because uh, Sophie says it's interesting because radical feminism ideology is that patriarchy is the root of all wars rather than religion in comparison to new atheism, which says it's because of religion. So radical feminists will tell you patriarchal, the patriarchal system is the root of all wars because I guess men are the ones responsible for war. And then um, I think what happens as well is that, you know, no one likes their ideology challenge. You know, we've been on that side where, you know, we see we saw pagans as you know they challenge our ideologies and our beliefs and i think the issue is that feminism challenges the root of their ideology so for example if you let women into the workplace and not just into the workplace but into leadership or into roles where for example stem so science technology engineering and maths it was always you know men women just aren't smart enough for these roles but as women are going getting into higher education they're getting degrees, masters, PhDs, they're getting into these roles. It challenges it, their ideologies 
from people like Darwin who say that women aren't irrational because these roles, you know, a lot of them, you know, they don't use, they're not focused on kind of the rational, they're not focused on emotion, they're quite rational. And I think there's also a bit in there in that if they allow radical feminism and equality to really take hold, it literally crushes their worldview, it crushes all of their ideologies that they've held on to. So it's almost, there's a bit of fear there that if they allow feminists in, it's literally going to show the errors in all of their ideologies. So there's this kind of like deep protection that we can't let the women in and have the equal access because it's going to destroy our worldview completely. Absolutely. So it's fear that their position is threatened. It's going to destroy their worldview, which will affect their position in society and their power base, I guess, that men hold the power and they don't want to relinquish it to women. And I think if we just we'll finish on libertarianism is that the basic root of libertarianism, again, is fear. And we saw this. Um, I don't think that the atheists would admit that they're afraid, but libertarians are a fear. What's their fear, a libertarian? Fear of, yeah, losing freedom, I think, which is how we were as Adventists as well, losing freedom and, and power, perhaps we could say, their, their individual power, because they don't want to be controlled. Can't write down this part, sorry. Fear of losing freedom. And um, what do you say? Fear of being controlled. And we traced this, I think, the other week that the Gamergate was a significant um, step in the libertarian theology taking root, and it led to January 6th. And it led to the, the, the information war. Yeah. Yes, in the middle of that, you've got 2016 election. So what the, in summary, if everybody knows about um, Gamergate, that um, there's the feeling of being threatened, that our freedom's being eroded, and it's moved beyond Republicans even talking about it. It's like it's gone bigger than just Republicans saying this, that there are people from 2014, there was a Guardian article in 2016 saying that Gamergate was partially responsible for Trump's victory in the general election. And the reason is because these Christians now, not Christians, sorry, these gamers who are atheistic men mostly, are, have a network now in which they can get together and have collusion. In, in the past, they never had a voice to be able to speak to each other. So what that did was, out of that sexual harassment campaign against women, it showed the, the male domination of the industry, the aggression, the violence that's brought about by these video games that women are trying to change now by coming in and making other video games that are not on that same line and not portraying women as sex objects, um, that they're, threat, they're a threat to the male dominated industry. And so they did this online harassment campaign to women. It's only when it became physical that people started threatening them in their homes and sending them dead animals and different things that they had to flee their homes, that the police got involved. And then now seeing how serious it is to have online information harassment, not just physically, but that moved then all those people behind the scenes, Gamergate was a hashtag that people used. And when they click on it, it was this right wing libertarian theology, I guess you could say, ideology is a better word, that mobilized those people to come together now and start talking about freedoms being eroded, et cetera, et cetera. And then that led to Trump being elected. And then that led to them all being able to meet in January 6th because people flew in from all over the United States for that event. And that would not have been possible if it was a normal war in old times, but because it's an information war, they can all talk on the internet now, they've got communication that they didn't have before. It means that a much bigger group of people can come together and do these revolutionary things than they could before. So they're basically fighting for freedom. Their underlying ethos is the same, is freedom over equality and the feeling that freedom is under threat. So fear is linking people to the fact that their freedoms are under threat and they should be able to be free to do what they want and believe what they want plus the fact that this atheistic element is becoming religious. This is a very strong ideology, which is another religion, really. It's becoming another religion to be anti-feminist, men's right, and atheistic is a, um, as strong as someone who says I'm a Catholic, almost, even though some of them wouldn't even know to label it that, that's what they are. So as we head towards the Sunday law, we see that all these things are bringing people together on this side, and that the true stream 
that its root is going to be anti this system of patriarchy and men oppression against women. And that's what the, it's a genderized test because that's polarizing the world into these two camps. So we don't know what it's going to look like. But. Um, I like uh, what Sophie said in that radical feminists recognize that it's the patriarchy that's the cause of 99% of the problems. Um, and just tying it back to the first quote that you read about the midnight cry coming to dispel darkness. Yeah. And the world being in darkness with regards to this structure that we've looked under, this patriarchy. And sure, yes, the world has done you know, it's part in dispelling that darkness. I believe led by God, because we know that God is the world people, yeah. for, his, for God's purpose. I think this. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, because, so the midnight cry comes to dispel darkness. Um, and tying it to our definitions that we gave ide to ideology and ethos, God's purpose is to build a character in his people to take to heaven. And how God does that is through imparting an ideology. Through every dispensation, God gives an ideology to humanity, or not an ideology, but expands on God's ideology of what our character should be. Mm -hmm. And it's fitting that right at the end, we've come to the patriarchy, we're dealing with the patriarchy, because that's, for earthly terms, that's the last thing that God needs to take care of, the underlying structure that all other problems have slavery built on top of the patriarchy, um, the Sunday law issue that fights freedom and equality built on top of the patriarchy. Yeah. You know, if we were to think of these stereotypically manly traits that men have held on to for so long, um, it all comes to its conclusion now. So I guess the unsaid question, unasked question is why do we speak about this so much? And it's just that because God's finishing the work of telling us his ideology and it ends with destroying the thing that's caused the most problems for humanity. And I think what was like you say, it's, it's the thing that's caused the most problems, but most of humanity don't recognize God's part in that or are anti God because of it. So we've been focused on the four, you know, we say the four commandments. And that if we'd come along now and talked about the people that just switched off, I don't want to hear about religion because I'm in this camp, religion's just irrational and you know they've thrown out god a long time ago so to come now with the sabbath argument we've got to meet them where they are which is the sixth commandment and like you're saying people are seeing the issues in society there are worldlings that see about this whole gender inequality like there were worldlings that saw that slavery was just nonsensical this is not right to do this at its root core and so they see the parable because this is parable teaching on earth they see the literal but they don't understand the spiritual because they can't see what God's part is in that because God is a patriarchal headship God in our time period. So now we're resetting on the on the six for us because we're now looking at, let's look at this parable on earth, let's look at how people relate to each other and how they're thinking, and let's get into their thinking where they're at, and then we're going to take them to where we're at because they're not ready to listen. But if we say, no, we're pro-women's rights, we're pro-equality, we agree with you, we absolutely do, even to this woman that's fled Somalia, we say, no, God isn't like that. He's like this. You know, and then and that's what they need. They need to see that we agree with them on this level to take them to that level. And I think that's where God's reset us so we can actually reach people where they are because we talk a different language than most people in the world. But now he's making us speak their language. Is it kind of like a concept that we have the four, um, but we need the six, and they have the six, but they need the four? So it's kind of like, it's yes, like yes. It's kind of almost, yes. God is kind of aligning us. And this is where Pavel keep teaching comes in. We have humanity and divinity, but we'd focus so much on the divinity, but we just discounted the humanity, but not recognizing that we are discounting the very tool that God's given us, which is the human physical parable that everyone else is living in. That we need to say, look, this is how it is here. That's how it is there. And we need to make it right here. To, in order to do that, we have to draw a right way of thinking down here to be able to point them to heaven. So we were back to front, really. Go on. I'm going to point, which is kind of right, what don't forget that we the world doesn't have the six no. That's why I right so the six is a bit polluted with the ideas of feminism left wing you know what is the correct position of love your neighbor what's the correct government to have or, you know what's the law of the kingdom we've got the patriarchy the feminism being part of the patriarchy through the bible yeah we know that it's got to be right Yeah. 
yeah, we have to show them how God is not patriarchal, even though his whole book. Yes. Yeah. yeah, look at the Bible. So we have to show progression. So we have parable teaching and progression to give them a correct picture of who God is. And then they might accept. Even the atheists who are in this camp, because they see that religion isn't doing anything for them, will say, okay, a God like that I could serve. Because he's not how I thought he was. So let's pray. Discussion. Dear loving God, we thank you for the methodology that you have given us, parable teaching that teaches us to look to earth, to understand heavenly things. And as we see people on the earth who do believe in equality, who do love their neighbour, it's a rebuke to us who should have been leading the way in that. We thank you for showing us equality, for showing us the true stream of information, help us to stay in this stream and guide and lead and direct our steps as we approach the Sunday law. We realize that we are right down at the end of time. We were in that hour of midnight, that last hour before your coming, and we pray that we would stay faithful. Help us to be encouraged by what we see. Help us to have the right ideology, that we might share it with others and that their hearts might be touched to serve the living God. We thank you now. We pray for this Sabbath day for a blessing. We ask that you would be with the rest of the meetings that are to be had and that you would guide us all into all truth and bless us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.